I'd like to speak today from a text of scripture that we generally tend to overlook. We read it and we don't pay much attention to it. I want to speak to you about the character in the Bible. Uh, in the Old Testament, someone who did great exploits for God, but many times we just see his name mentioned just twice in scripture, so we have a tendency to just skim over what he accomplished in his lifetime. His name is mentioned only twice in the Bible, once in Judges chapter 3 and verse 31, and the other time in Judges chapter 5 and verse 6. I want to speak to you from the life of a man called Shamgar. Let's look at Judges 3 and verse 31. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Let me give you a background of the text. It's important that we look at God's word in its context. The Bible says that after the death of Joshua, God raised different leaders to lead the nation of Israel. One thing that we notice in Israel during that period, that every time they had a godly leader, they walked in the ways of the Lord. But then when the Lord blessed them and when they began to prosper, they turned away from the God who blessed them. Someone rightly said, many people fail the prosperity test. They are able to deal with adversity, but many times they fail the prosperity test. When we are blessed, when we have abundance, when we live in houses that we have not built, drink from wells that we have not dug, when we enjoy the fruits of vineyards that we have not planted, there is a tendency for us to turn away from God. And so in the book of Judges, you see the cycle. Whenever God blessed them and prospered them, instead of being grateful to God, they turned away from God. Then the Lord allowed a foreign power to rule over them, to oppress them. And then guess what happened? They turned back to God. And when they turned back to God, God sent different deliverers. Many, many people God raised during this time. We read up of people like Gideon, like Samson, like Jephthah, Deborah, Barak, and many others. Tucked away in this text is a man called Shamgar. We don't have much details about him. Most likely, he was in the field with oxen. The Bible says at that time, the Philistines attacked Israel. What was in his hands was a simple ox goad. Now an ox goad is not a weapon of warfare. What is an ox goad? An ox goad is a simple rod with a hook in front of it. It was used in olden times when the oxen would get tired and when they wouldn't move at the pace that they should, the farmer would use the ox goad to spur the animal to move forward. By no standards was it a weapon. But the Bible says, when the enemies came against the people of God, this man stood with an ox goad in his hands and he dealt with 600 Philistines single-handedly. But the phrase that stands out for me as I look into God's word is he too delivered Israel. I've entitled this message as Shamgar, an obscure deliverer. The famous pastor John Stott once said, there are two ways in which you can live your life. Either you can live for personal glory or you can live for God's glory. There are only two ways in which a Christian can live his or her life. Either you live for your own glory or you live for God's glory. I'm reminded of the words of God to Baruch who was the scribe of Jeremiah. The Bible says in Jeremiah 45 and verse 5, these are the words that God is speaking to Jeremiah. Are you desiring great things for yourself? 
Are you seeking for great things for yourself? Don't seek it. It's an admonition to Baruch. Are you trying to seek fame and name and popularity? You want to be big and great? Don't seek it. Contrast that with another verse in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, it says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. That is the call on our lives, that we will glorify God through whatever we do. I want to draw three simple but very powerful truths from the life of Shamgar. What can we learn from this deliverer in Israel. What did he do? What can we observe from the text? And what can we take back as an application for our own lives? The first principle that stands out from this story is Shamgar used what he had. An ox goat was an unlikely weapon. It was not used in conventional warfare. But at a time when he needed to step up to a challenge, he used what he already had. We live in times of great comparison. People constantly compare with other people. I am not as talented as them. I don't have the resources that they have. I don't have the expertise. I don't have the experience that is required. That's why I can't be involved in this kind of work. The problem with comparison is twofold. When you compare with someone better than you, you get discouraged. When you compare with someone inferior to you, you get proud. Either way, comparison is not the way God wants us to live our lives with. So one of the things we can learn from this man is he chose to use what he already had. Do you know something? God does not call the qualified. He qualifies whom he calls. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 28, God has not called the wise by human standards. God has not called the influential. God has not called those from noble birth. God has chosen the foolish to shame the wise. He has chosen the weak to shame the strong. He has chosen the lowly to shame the things that are so that no flesh can ever glory in his presence. Amen. One of the things for us to recognize is God wants us to start with what we already have. I'm fascinated by that story of the call of Moses. When God called Moses, he was 80. By no standards would you recruit an 80 year old man for an assignment, a major assignment, correct? 80 years, you are in the sunset years of your life. The best years of your life are gone. But that's the time when God chooses this man and says, I have an important assignment for you. Go and stand before Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And then, of course, in chapter 3, there is this big dialogue that happens between God and Moses. God is encouraging Moses to go on this assignment. And Moses is giving multiple reasons why he is not the right person, why he cannot do the task that God is asking him to do. And then at a certain point in chapter 4, we read Moses saying, what if they don't believe that you have sent me? Suppose the people don't believe that you have sent me. And what if the people say, the Lord did not appear to you? What should I do? He has a question. And do you know what's the answer God gave? God asked him a separate question again. The reply to a question is another question. He asked God the question, what should I do if they don't believe that you have sent me? What if they say the Lord did not appear to you? What is God's response to Moses? God says, Moses, what 
is in your hands? A simple question. What is in your hands? Do you know something, brothers and sisters? The assignment that God has given to you, many times the resources, the things that you require for that assignment is already in your hands. Amen? It's already there. The problem is we have not noticed it. We have not stepped back and reflected on what God has already placed in our hands. What was in Moses' hands? An ordinary rod. But what I like in this story, in Exodus 4 and verse 2, it was the rod of Moses. In Exodus 4 and verse 20, the Bible says, Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Something happened between Exodus 4.2 and Exodus 4.20. Something happened. There was a divine transaction that took place. This ordinary rod that Moses had, he surrendered it to God. From that point on, it no longer was the rod of Moses. From now on, it was going to become the rod of God. Hallelujah. What is in your hands? What are you willing to put into the hands of God? When you put what you have into the hands of God, it no longer remains yours. It now becomes an instrument that God can use for His purpose and for His glory. I look in the Bible that this principle is there throughout the scriptures. You remember the story in 2 Kings chapter 4 when there is a widow that comes to Elisha and says, the creditors have come. My husband feared the Lord. They are going to take away our two sons. What can you do for us? How can you help me? Elisha looked at her. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2. What is in your house? Think about that. Question to Moses, what is in your hands? Question to the widow, what is in your house? What was in her house? A jar of oil. Guess what? That jar of oil was going to be the source of the miracle. The Lord says through Elisha to her, go and borrow vessels of all sizes and all shapes. Go and lock the door. And start pouring. And the Bible says, not only was the debt met, she lived off what she had for the rest of that period of time. That is what God does. Amen. The God who multiplies, who blesses the little that you and I place in God's hands. The story of the five loaves and two fishes is recorded across the four Gospels. It's an amazing story of a little boy who gave his little food into the hands of Jesus. The Bible says that at the end, not only was the multitude fed, but there was more left at the end. Twelve baskets left at the end than at the beginning. Amen. What is it that God has entrusted to you? Do you know you're not the owner of the things that you have? As a follower of Jesus, it is important to recognize that you are only a steward. You are not the owner. You are only a manager. In today's context, a manager does not own anything. A manager only takes care of, protects, safeguards something that belongs to the owner. It's important for us to recognize we don't own anything. We didn't bring anything into this world. We will not take anything with us. We came empty, we will leave empty. But we must remember that there are many things that God has placed in our hands that He wants us to steward, that He wants us to take care of, be a good manager, that we will take care of that, that one day He will look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little things. Now, come and enjoy the joy of the Lord. This morning, the question that comes to us is what is in your hands? Do you know God can use anything? In the Bible, I see that he used a raven to feed a prophet. He used a donkey to speak to Balaam. 
He used a fish, a coin in the fish's mouths to pay taxes for Peter. He used a fish to teach a disobedient prophet. He can use anybody. He can use anything. But are you willing to lay it into the hands of God? Do you have children that you are struggling to raise? You know, there are some periods of turbulence in the life of a child, particularly when they hit teenage. Parents of teenagers can say sometimes, I'm finding it difficult to raise this child. I'm not able to understand what's happening. This child was so pleasant, so easy to get along with. Suddenly things are looking different. Can you lay that child into the hands of God and say, God, you are the one who gave this child to me. And you are the owner of this child. You know, when you dedicated that child to the Lord, you laid that child's future into God's hands. And you said, you are the giver. You are the owner. I'm just the manager. I'm just the steward taking care of this child. What is in your hands? What are you willing to put into the hands of God? I remember when I received the call to ministry, I was a college student. And I remember going to some of the elders. My father had gone to be with the Lord. I went to some of the elders in my church and shared my vision, my burden. And I remember one of them was not particularly pleased. He was my father's associate. And uh, he made a comment that hurt me deeply. I heard him say to somebody, he said, people think that ministry is child's play. Young people think that they know a lot of things. You know, you need some gray hair before you can come into ministry. And uh, the way he said it and the context in which he said it, I clearly knew that he was directing that conversation to me. And so I was discouraged. In my heart, I said, you know, here I am, a young college student wanting to serve the Lord. And some of these older people, instead of encouraging me, they are like a wet blanket trying to dampen that enthusiasm that I had. And one day I was reading through the word of the Lord and it was my morning devotion. I came across the story of Samson. And in that story, there is that powerful truth that one day Samson took the jawbone of a donkey and he killed a thousand Philistines. And as I was reading that scripture, I heard the voice of the Spirit speak to me. If I can use the jawbone of a donkey, can I not use you? That day, I settled that issue with the Lord. I said, okay, Lord, it doesn't matter what people say. I'm giving the rest of my life to you. I want to testify that this same associate of my father later became one of my greatest supporters. He stood for me, defended me. He became a, a supporter in the ministry. God turned things around in my life. But that was a test that was placed before me. Would I quit or would I recognize all that I have? I want to lay it into the hands of God. Amen. Whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you are middle-aged, whatever stage you are in right now, can you say, Lord, the rest of this, I give it into your hands. I lay what I have been given. I leave it into your hands. Do what you please with it. I'm encouraged when I think about Vijay Benedict, the singer. He was a Bollywood a playback singer. And then he had an encounter with the Lord. And Vijay Benedict said, I want to sing for the Lord. And he decided, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my career only for singing for God. Using that God-given ability to glorify God. Several years ago, my wife and I, we were in Dimapur, Nagaland. And we came across this graduate who studied at SABC in the early 90s. He is from Manipur. The Lord is using him tremendously uh, in that region. And one of the gifts that the Lord has given him is to paint. Uh, he's an excellent artist. He makes portraits and he makes pictures. And uh, people buy his paintings for thousands of rupees. And he uses every penny out of that to support the work of the Lord in Manipur. He's using a God-given ability for the glory of God. What is your God-given ability? What is it that God has endowed and placed inside you? What is it that you are willing to say, Lord, this is something that I want to leave into your hands. The little that you will entrust to God 
God will bless it, multiply it, and take it to the multitudes. Amen. Hallelujah. As you are seated in church, I want to ask you the same question. What is in your hands? What are you willing to leave at the altar and say, God, this I lay it at your feet. What are you willing to surrender for the purposes of God? Let me move to the second truth from this passage. The second aspect that we can learn from Shamgar's life is he began where he was, in the place where God had placed him. Most likely, with an ox goat, you wouldn't be in a palace. You would be in the field. The place that God had chosen for him, in that place, he made a difference. You are sovereignly placed by God in a particular place with a reason. There is a specific place that God intended that you should be in. There is a specific audience that you are called to minister to. When I read in the Bible, I look at Jonah, who had a specific audience, the Ninevites to whom he was sent. I look at the Apostle Paul, there was a specific audience, the Gentiles to whom he was sent. I look at Peter, a specific audience sent to the Jews. There is a specific audience to which you are called. A specific group of people that you are supposed to influence. A specific group that God has placed you in. That you can make a difference for the glory of God. I like that verse in Acts 17 and verse 26. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them, the exact places where they should live. Do you know the place where you are today is where God has sovereignly planted you and placed you? There is a task for you to do that nobody else can do. There is a God-given assignment that has been entrusted to you. In that space, in that place, will you make a difference? That sphere of influence. You know, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be people of influence. Amen? We are supposed to make a difference. We have been placed in a particular place. I want to lead you through few examples from the history of the church. There was a man called William Wilberforce. God called him into the arena of politics and legislation. When you study history, William Wilberforce was the man who stood against a lot of evil in society, the slave trade in England. He stood against it. He was one of the people who lifted his voice and said, that is wrong. There was a time in England when little boys were sent up chimneys, chimney sweeps to clean the chimney. And there were times when these little boys, less than 10, would fall from these heights and die. William Wilberforce said, that is wrong. He stood in parliament and fought. He fought throughout his life for single mothers, for orphans, for juvenile delinquents. His sphere of influence was legislation. God had called him. He recognized the fact, I am placed by God in this arena of influence to make a difference. Do you know you are placed by God in a particular area to make a difference? I think of Robert Rakes. The whole Sunday school movement is credited to Robert Rakes. Robert Rakes at one point of time noticed that there are many children who work in factories and they are missing out on basic education. And so he decided, why not start a school for them on Sundays? And that's how the Sunday school was started. And his curriculum was the Bible. His textbook was the Bible. And he used lay people from the church to teach these children. That's how we now know of what is called a Sunday school. But there was a need 
when Robert Rake said, I want to impact children. I look at John and Charles Wesley. That was a time in Europe when revolution was happening. People were standing up against the rich, the famous, the monarchs. They made sure that they will fight against those in authority. And that was the time two brothers, John and Charles Wesley, went around England preaching. Secular historians say, but for the ministry of John and Charles Wesley, John Wesley was the preacher, Charles Wesley was the songwriter. These brothers made a difference in England at that time. Secular historians say, but for the ministry of these brothers, what happened in France, the French Revolution, would have happened in England. There was such anger against the rich and the monarchs and the people in leadership. It was the ministry of these brothers that made a difference. I read about William and Catherine Booth. They wanted to take the church to the people. They said, we want to make the church accessible we don't want to just take of spiritual needs of people. We want to address physical needs. And so Salvation Army was birthed. They were people who said, we want to make a difference. One of the quotations of William Booth that touched my life was, you cannot better the future if you are not willing to disturb the present. You cannot better the future if you are not willing to disturb the present. These were people, they saw a need and they said, we cannot keep quiet. We need to do something about it. Closer home, I read about Ida Scudder. Fascinating story. If you have not read it, I want to encourage you to read the life of Ida Scudder, the founder of Christian Medical College, CMC, Wello. There was a time when in one night, people came to her and said, help this lady who's expecting they were not willing to ask a male doctor to attend to their wives. They would rather let their wives die than let a, a male doctor attend. And that is what prompted Ida Scudder to train and to come back to the nation of India to start CMC Wello. Today, it is testimonial to her sacrifice and her recognizing a need and saying, I need to respond. Pandita Ramabai, the Mukti mission. There was a time when there were child widows in the end of the 20th century when these child widows were being neglected. She stood up and said, I will find a place of refuge for them. Now followers of Jesus have never been called to be neutral. Are you listening to me? Jesus said, those who are not for me are against me. There is no neutral zone when it comes to following Jesus. You have to take a stand. You have to make a difference. Jesus used two simple but powerful metaphors. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. This is found in the Sermon on the Mount. Do you know both of these agents are not neutral agents? Salt cannot be put without things getting salty. Light cannot enter without dispelling darkness. You and I as followers of Jesus are not called to be fence sitters. We are not called to play safe. We are not called to maybe, I don't know. We are not called to take a neutral stand. We are called to stand firmly in a dark world and shine for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God is not calling us to just be there and to watch helplessly as wrong things happen, but to stand up at some point and say, I will be a voice. I will make a difference in the place where God has placed me. In your office, in your business, in your building, in your neighborhood, in your school, in your college, you may say, I'm the only one. That's fine. Can you make a difference for Jesus? Can you say, Lord, you have placed me here. And with your help, by your grace, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make it count. I remember in Calcutta, there would be youngsters who would talk to me. And I would spend a lot of time with youngsters. 
And some of them would say something like this, I wish I was born in a developed nation. You know, there are no opportunities here. You know, there's so many people and there's so little jobs. What are we supposed to do? And I always encouraged them and said, I'm so glad that I was born in this nation because I am born in this nation for such a time as this. You are born in this nation for such a time as this. Yes, things may not look rosy right now. Things may not look perfect and promising, but one thing is certain, God has a plan for our nation. Amen, do you believe that? God has a plan for our nation, recognize that. And He has placed you and me as part of His plan for this nation. You and I are placed in this nation to make a difference, to, to change things, to change the atmosphere. Now God has a plan for India. Things may look different at this moment, but I'm deeply convinced that God has a plan for India. I'm always fascinated to think that our nation is mentioned twice in the Bible. Think about that. Esther 1, 1, Esther 8, 9, the nation of India is mentioned in the Bible. Our nation was so important in the plan of God that one of the apostles, one of the 12, came to our shores in AD 52. St. Thomas's Mount in Chennai is testimonial to that fact. He was speared to death in our nation. God has a plan for our nation. How many of you know that God loves people? Anybody? There is no shortage of people in our nation. 1.3 billion and counting. China has no chance with a one-child policy. We will outrun them at some point of time. The fact of the matter is God loves people. I am reminded of that song. God loves people more than anything. More than anything he wants us to know. He'd rather die than let them go because God loves people more than anything. God loves the weary when they are too weak to try. He feels their pain. He knows their shame. He cries with those who cry. He won't give up or walk away when other people do because God loves people more than anything. More than anything, he wants us to go. And show the world so that they will know that God loves people more than anything. There is no paucity of people in the nation of India. Is that right? We are placed by God in this nation for such a time as this. Recognize that. Recognize your sentness. Recognize that the fact that you are sovereignly placed by God in this nation to make a difference for the glory of God. Two things we can learn from him. We have looked at it. Number one, he used what he had. Shamgar used what he had. Number two, Shamgar began where he was. Some people want to go to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth but they don't want to start in their neighborhood. They want to go to the ends of the earth, but they don't want to start in their own building. They don't want to start in their own office. Start where you are. Recognize that you are the one placed by God. There is an assignment. There is a group of people you are called to. You are called to serve them. You are called to reflect God's love to them. Start right there and see God at work. The third thing we can learn from this man, he did what he could. Shamgar used what he had. He began where he was. He did what he could. You know what's a liberating thought? God knows your capacity. He knows what you are capable of. All that he's asking of you is, can you do your 100%? That's all. Do what you can. When you and I do what we can, God will do what we cannot. Amen? If you and I will decide to take that first step and do what we can, God will do what you and I can never imagine 
unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or imagine that is our god start by doing what you can you know god does not make you a clone of somebody else you are not called to be a duplicate he made you special you are not mass produced you are custom made recognize that he didn't mass produce you he made you unique the psalmist says in psalms 139 i am fearfully and wonderfully made you knit me in my mother's womb your dna is different your retina scan is different your fingerprints are different the timber of your voice is different you are different god does not have a photocopying machine in his office he doesn't mass produce and send into the world he made you special because he has a task for you and that task you are called to fulfill so when we start doing what we can god will begin to do what we cannot i want to use a acronym that is found in a book called the purpose driven life i've done a series at your church in that book pastor rick warren uses this acronym called shape s stands for spiritual gifts the time when you accepted the lord when the holy spirit touched your life he placed spiritual gifts already inside you you don't have to pray for it it's already there it may be dormant it may not be used it may not have reached that full potential but it is already placed in you spiritual gifts that have been placed first corinthians 12 Romans 12, Ephesians 4 are passages that talk about the spiritual gifts that God has placed in your life. H stands for heart. God has placed within you a passion for certain things. Another word for heart is the word passion. What is it that keeps you awake at night? What is it that brings tears to your eyes? What is it that when you see it something snaps and you say I want to do something to change that that holy discontent I cannot keep quiet about this issue I need to do something about it that is the passion that God has placed in your heart in your life A stands for natural abilities you know you may be good at writing you may be good at music you may be good at sports you may be good at mathematics you may be good at languages there are some natural abilities that god has already given you can you lay it at the feet of jesus and say god i'll use it for you this gift i want to use it for your glory p stands for personality look around this room and you will recognize we all are different some of us are quiet introverted some of us are vivacious talkative extroverts some of us make a silent entry some of us uh, enter in such a way to say look i am here you know we are different god has wired us differently you know it's easy to work with the grain than against the grain and god knows your personality he crafted you for you to look at yourself and say that i want to use my personality to glorify god e stands for experiences and you've gone through numerous experiences good bad positive negative experiences those experiences can be a great blessing for the kingdom of god the pain that you have experienced many times can be a source of comfort for others second corinthians 1:4 god comforts us in our tribulation that we may comfort others with the comfort we have received this acronym shape has been very beneficial for me to look at my own life and to evaluate am i using my spiritual gifts my passion heart my ability my personality my experiences to serve god am i doing the best that i can and leaving the rest into god's hands first peter chapter 4 and verse 10 this is what it says each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of god's grace in various forms each of you should use the gifts that god has given 
as stewards. It has been placed in your hands. In Matthew 25, in the parable of talents, the master gave everybody different set of talents. Five, two, one. The original is bags of gold. Each one according to their ability. He has given you something. Can you turn it back to God and say, God, I want to use it for the glory of God. You know, when I read about this man, Shamgar, what stands out for me is simple. He was an ordinary man, but he did exploits for God's kingdom. How did he do it? He used what he had. He began where he was. He did what he could. The Holy Spirit is able to help you to become more than you are. He anointed a shepherd boy to become a king. He empowered a murderer to become a deliverer. He enabled a fisherman to become a disciple. He chose a carpenter to become a messiah. God chooses ordinary people. But when we surrender that little that we have to God, He takes the little, He blesses it, He multiplies it, and it becomes a great blessing to the multitudes.